I appreciate you guys uh, being here and I'm going to try and find myself here um, on there we are okay now uh, okay so there is a definite delay here because I'm watching myself as I'm actually doing it on the tablet that I'm filming this with and uh, I'm watching the uh, delay and what you're actually seeing on my little computer here and so um, I can see that there is a delay but on my computer I will be able to read your comments and questions and and whatever I can see that this looks really fuzzy okay we understand that uh, the only thing available around here is CenturyLink it's DSL and for any of you that know anything about computers uh, we get like uh, something ridiculously slow like 500 kilobytes a second or something um, on uh, upload so it's going to look fuzzy for a lot of it. It's going to break down. Some of it will look all right, and some of it won't. Uh, so, and it's going to just keep restarting here. But I also have a video camera over here, and uh, I'll be going back and forth looking between the two cameras. Last week I spent the whole time staring at this one, and it looked funny on the video. But um, I want you to know that it will be available on the video uh, and uh, probably tonight, tomorrow morning at the latest. And the quality uh, of sound and picture on the video is going to be a, a lot higher than this. However, on this you can bring in your uh, comments and, and questions and things. Um, this is funny because I'm getting comments and questions on that one, but they aren't coming up over here, uh, which I thought they would. Um, but they aren't, and if I have to lean forward here and uh, see, well, uh, Shane Crowley says, God bless you, Brother David. Um, and uh, Pastor... Somebody, uh, Nadim, uh, says, Pastor, I want, um, oh, heck, I can pick this up and look at it here. Um, Nadim Sarter says, Pastor, I want to talk with you about Church of Hope in Pakistan. Um, let me tell you something, Nadim. Um, I am, uh, a retired missionary. I live on a very very uh, small pension and what that means is that having uh, almost 2,000 followers now um, and hundreds of them in Africa, India, Pakistan um, and even some small remote parts of the world uh, that I don't even know much about. I have followers in Bhutan and what that means is that I am not able to financially support overseas ministries, nor am I able to post uh, what 200 different people uh, want me to post about their ministries. It's just impossible um, for me to do that. It would take up all day, and it would take up my whole Facebook page. I apologize for that. Um, We'll pray for you. We'll pray for the work in Pakistan, for the work in Africa, for the work in India, uh, for the work in uh, China, all over the place. And I want to greet the people who are watching now from uh, South Africa and Pakistan and India and Bhutan. And uh, we have uh, people watching from all over the place. And so I just... Uh, want to greet you in the name of Jesus and say how glad I am that you've joined us here and uh, say that we do pray for you who are in ministry. I worked um, 
about seven years in the jungles and backwoods of, of Venezuela. Uh, I know what it is. I lived in a very, very tiny uh, unpainted house with a tin roof um, for many years, and I lived on $200 a month or less um, in support. And uh, uh, I worked with pastors who had no support other than what little they could make off of the economy uh, by doing odd jobs or whatever. And uh, I know it can be done. I know you do not need money from the states uh, to make it work, uh, that God can provide from around where you are. And I know that firsthand from experience. Uh, let me tell you a quick story. I remember I had a wife and a small baby, and uh, we were in our house, and we had nothing to eat. Uh, there was no support money. I had no cash, uh, had nothing, and uh, we had eaten the last of our food, and we sat down to eat, and uh, we sat down at the table anyway, nothing to eat. Uh, I think we had canned milk for the baby, uh, but that was about it, and uh, so we just said, we said a prayer, and we said, thank you, Lord, for providing, and uh, we hadn't even said amen when uh, somebody knocked at the door, and it was our neighbor, and uh, her name was Rosa, and never forget Rosa, and uh, she just knocked at the door, and Kathy went and answered the door, and Rosa said, Kathy, I cook too much of this. Can you folks use it? Can you guys use it? And, of course, we were extremely grateful. Um, I'm not sure that we shared with her that we had no food or not. Uh, but um, we thanked her, and we thanked God for his provision. And I have seen him do that over and over and over again in poor places where there were no dollars, where there was no money, and... Uh, even now, the people we worked with in Venezuela are, uh, it's a very poor, bad situation down there. It is awful. Food is extremely scarce, and yet the Church of Jesus Christ in Venezuela is holding feeding programs, and uh, they're taking their little ration of food because food's being rationed very strictly, and they're taking food out of their rations and using it to feed children uh, in poor tribal areas uh, where uh, they're just at the moment is nothing and the kids are hungry and the Church of Jesus Christ is taking food uh, out of their own mouths and using it to feed the children so I want to encourage those of you in different parts of the world um, to understand that no matter what happens, and you folks that are in the United States, things are about to get really bad. I believe that with all my heart. And we're going to see hunger in this country, and we're going to see deprivation. But you need to understand that our God is capable and more than able to provide for his children wherever they are and whatever the circumstances are. So um, let me look down here. There's a lot of people... Uh, watching, awesome testimony, hallelujah. Uh, let me set this back down over here um, without throwing it on the floor, preferably. And uh, we'll uh, talk about that, and I'll ask for some questions later, and uh, we'll uh, just do that. Um, let's talk about what's happening. Uh, when I check the... Uh, Dow this morning, it was uh, it had gone straight down. Well, now it's wiggling around up and down a little bit. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the stock market today or this week or whatever. There is nothing that says that anything has to happen today. Um, however, um, it is notable that two things have happened. Uh, the Jubilee year, which was declared in Israel this last year, um, is over. Um, the last day has finished at sunset uh, last night, 
and this is the first uh, day of the new year. The Jewish year is 5777. Uh, the, the rabbis and their unsaved people, mind you, and a lot of them work with the Talmud and not with uh, the, uh, they work with the Talmud and they don't work with uh, the Torah or the Word of God, actually. And uh, they get into some pretty strange stuff. But nonetheless, they're looking at these three sevens and they're saying, hey, you know, this is special. Three sevens in the year and um, that's just another sign that makes us believe that Messiah is coming this year. Well, if you read what they're saying about Messiah, um, it becomes patently obvious very, very quickly uh, that their idea of Messiah, Mashiach, um, who is coming, is the same idea they had when they missed Jesus. Um, they're looking for a Messiah who's going to come in as a military leader. He's going to come in uh, very strong, and he's going to uh, basically rule the world from Jerusalem. He is going to be uh, a superhero, and uh, Jerusalem will, in their, in their understanding, rule the world. Israel will be the capital of the whole world um, in the way they're believing, in the way they're looking. And so I understand that to be what the New Testament and even parts of the Old Testament talk about as being the Antichrist. And so we're talking about the Antichrist. Uh, we are not talking about Jesus Christ returning. But it is um, an interesting thing. Uh, several people have noted to me that um, God in the Old Testament always held off on judgment during a Jubilee year. Uh, and so uh, that may be why nothing happened at the end of the Shemitah, because we went immediately into a Jubilee year. And uh, that sort of thing could happen uh, today, this week, any time. With this uh, coming up uh, election, uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you this, it's going to be bad. And no candidate, I don't care. I don't like Hillary, I don't like Trump, I don't like any of them. Um, and they wouldn't even be in the election if they didn't belong to the devil, because you have to be in that circle, in that uh, realm, uh, in order to even get in there. And it's sort of like choosing between two demons. And so it's a, it's a bad situation. Uh, we could have all sorts of things happen. Uh, I would not be surprised at all to see martial law declared before the election and see us uh, come to the point where uh, we're just under absolute martial law and there is no election and Obama uh, appoints Hillary. Uh, then there's Hillary's uh, vice presidential pick who is Jesuit trained. He, he spent at least one summer as a Jesuit missionary in uh, South America, in Central America. Um, Jesuit trained, Jesuit educated, solid uh, Catholic guy. And we understand that Pope Francis um, is a Jesuit and he is Catholic. And anyone who is a Jesuit has sworn, and you can look up on, on Google, you can Google the, uh, the oath of, of the Jesuits and uh, they just swear their life away on a blood oath. They literally cut their finger and sign their name in blood um, on these blood oaths, uh, swearing absolute, instant, unquestioned obedience to superiors in the order and to the Pope. And uh, literally, if the Pope told a Jesuit president, drop a nuclear bomb over Oklahoma City, uh, 
he would do his very best. To, he, if he couldn't drop a nuclear bomb over Oklahoma City, he would die trying. And uh, it may be that Hillary's health fails after she gets in office um, and that he becomes uh, president. We have a Jesuit pope. Uh, it looks like Obama could very reasonably be picked as the uh, uh, secretary general of the United Nations. And imagine that. We've got uh, a Jesuit pope who's supporting all of this one world government. Um, we have Obama with his Islamic craziness and one world order kind of uh, mentality as Secretary General. Uh, uh, and and uh, a Jesuit president, a Jesuit pope, and an Islamic crazy as the head of, of the United Nations. What a combination that would be. <laughs> Uh, I just, you know, can't imagine that. And the whole United States locked down under martial law because uh, Trump supporters are all upset that uh, that the election didn't go their way. And uh, we could have, and we have racial tension uh, at an all-time high. We have a white billionaire, longtime racist, who's given a hundred million dollars to Black Lives Matter. Um, and why would he do that? Um, good question. The only answer I can come up with is that he really wants them to start a war that he's pretty sure they can't win. Uh, being outnumbered seven to one, if you throw in the, the uh, Hispanics, uh, they're outnumbered 10 to one, 12 to one. Um, and uh, I think he really wants them uh, to start a war that will just decimate uh, the African-American population in the United States. And uh, I don't think they can see through that. The deception is so great that they can't, the, the people in Black Lives Matter in that area uh, just cannot comprehend that. Uh, they like the money, and they don't care why he gave it to them. And uh, they wouldn't believe me if I sat down and pointed that out to them. Uh, only the Spirit of God can can talk about things like that. So we're talking about uh, current events. Um, let me have over the next couple of minutes some questions, and I'll pick up uh, the tablet and look at it here. And uh, it it takes about... Uh, we're at least 60 seconds delay in what I'm doing and uh, what you're seeing. So as soon as you hear this, um, it would be nice if you'd put some, some questions in. Uh, Brenda says, good morning. Um, and she says, they shall be blinded, which is true. They shall be uh, blinded. Does anybody else have any questions here um, and uh, we'll wait a minute or two here and uh, see what's going on uh, da, 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 da. anyway it's an interesting time to live and uh, I want you to know and to understand that whatever happens God is in control and your faith needs to be in uh, Jesus Christ and nothing else. Because listen, uh, I'll tell you something. Nothing, 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 nothing is going to support you. Nothing's going to help you except a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, can't stop prophecy, but I'm praying for time. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Thomas says, thank you for your good efforts. Uh, Marcos, who do you believe is the second beast of Revelation? Um, it's interesting that the uh, Jews believe that there will be two antichrists. Uh, the Muslims also believe that there will be the 12th Imam and that Jesus will return um, and Jesus uh, will 
back up uh, the, the 12th Imam um, or the Caliph and, uh, and he will declare that he too is a Muslim and that he too follows uh, Muhammad and Allah and uh, they'll work together. So that's from the Muslim point of view. The Jews have a very complicated idea, the Talmudic Jews, um, that there will be uh, a younger and an older. Um, there will be one that comes first, and then there will be a second who comes behind him who supports him. Uh, we have a two-headed beast. We have um, all of these different things. So we know that there is... Uh, an antichrist and there is a false prophet this is what the bible calls it and so uh, i i don't know who is who i really don't i have a lot of uh, of ifs and maybes my current idea is this very simple um i think that the antichrist or at least one of them is going to be a fully credentialed Jew because I cannot see the Jews accepting anyone who's not a Jew as their Messiah. Now, mind you that uh, the Rothschilds claim to be Jewish. Some of the most evil people on the face of the earth claim Jewish blood. So that's not impossible. The the, the chief Luciferians, the people who run the world's banking system, um, all claim to be uh, Jews. Uh, and so uh, that's quite possible. Um, I'm not going to throw out names, except that I do believe that uh, uh, whether he's a false prophet or whether he is uh, the... Uh, uh, Antichrist, I'm not sure, but I am almost positive that Pope Francis is one or the other. I lean towards false prophet. I think that the uh, uh, the Messiah, uh, Antichrist, uh, is going to come along and that he will be really, really pushed and supported uh, by the Pope. But that's just my personal belief. I don't have any absolute word from the Lord on that. Um, so Thomas says, I firmly believe God is in control. And of course, God is in control. However, you have to also understand that the Bible says um, that the Antichrist is given power and authority to make war against the saints and to overcome them. And he is given authority over every tribe and tongue and nation. He is given authority over the whole world. He's given authority to make war against the saints of God and to overcome them. That means he wins. Um, the last two standing opponents to Antichrist are the two prophets. Uh, they're killed. Their bodies lie in the street for three days and Everybody watches them and looks at their bodies, and after three days, they're taking them to heaven, and that's pretty much um, at the end. And when they die and go off to heaven, uh, the devil is one. There are no more representatives, not even one representative of Jehovah God left alive on the face of the earth. Um, the the uh, uh, rapture, is going to happen sometime before that. But what I see happening, and people have all kinds of arguments over this stuff, um, but what I see happening is uh, the rapture comes, um, and uh, these two Jewish prophets are killed, and they go off to heaven. Um, and there's just nothing left, and Satan sort of thinks he wins. Um, and he comes against uh, Israel, and the whole world lines up against Israel. And then God, Jesus Christ, uh, with the saints behind him, 
comes out of uh, heaven with fire in his mouth and he burns them up and uh, the false prophet and the antichrist are are thrown into the lake of fire and uh, the devil uh, is locked up for a thousand years and Jesus rules and reigns and uh, we rule and reign with him that's how I see it uh, and uh, just saying that is going to bring people out of the woodwork who disagree with me. And uh, that's, I guess, all right. Uh, but if you want to know how I see it, that's how I see it. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Brenda uh, White and Michael Beckman uh, say when in Israel they have billboards and statues to the Rothschilds. Well, go on YouTube and look up uh, the uh, Supreme Court building in Jerusalem um, and look it up. It was built by the Rothschilds. It is an absolute temple to the Luciferian Masonic religion. Uh, as you watch the video, you'll see uh, as they walk through the place and Everything is layered, the number of steps, the colors, the fountains, the skylights, um, the, the statues, everything is absolutely Luciferian and Masonic. And uh, it was designed, paid for, built completely by the Rothschilds, and they love the Rothschilds. Uh, the Knesset building is not so obviously demonic, but it's pretty demonic. And... Uh, that was also bought and paid for, completely built uh, with Rothschild money. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that they, uh, especially the ones who are ignorant of scripture, are, are thrilled uh, with the uh, Rothschilds. I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, what about the three DNA baby? Um, uh, it's already been done. Um, obviously, this is messing with God. Um, this is uh, not good stuff. Um, they're talking about uh, really messing with DNA and uh, mixing people with computers, um, creating super soldiers uh, by messing with the DNA and taking all fear. Um, out of the soldier uh, so that you have a whole bunch of soldiers that are not afraid to die have no fear whatsoever um, and you can imagine a highly trained uh, very physical soldier and not just one but thousands of them who have had their DNA messed with to, to where they have no fear uh, imagine that as a force uh, and so that's going to be uh, really sort of crazy. Uh, let's, uh, I'm not getting any more questions right this second. So uh, what I'm going to do is set this thing back down, and we're going to talk about something in the Bible. I promise to go over um, Revel uh, Romans chapter 14. So let's look at Romans chapter 14 for a little bit. Um, and if I can get into my little Bible thing here. If you got a Bible, it would be really helpful if you went to uh, Romans uh, chapter 14. And we'll read this. Uh, and I'll start in verse 1. Accept anyone who is weak in faith. And I'm reading out of the HCSB, which is the Hallman Christian Standard Bible. Um, I am not stuck. Um, I've got some people that have come on as friends again, and it cycles through. Um, they come on. They go through this whole thing of planting arguments, and, and they make completely absurd comments. Um, that have nothing to do with what I posted above. Um, and they post their videos and they try uh, 
to get new people in and they try to convince me and they try and convince everybody else uh, that King James is the uh, only uh, Bible you should read and somehow the fact that the language is old and, and, and sounds so pretty even though you can't understand it and the fact that some kind of pagan British king uh, authorized it makes it fancy or, or better than the others um, but I don't believe that I've been involved in, in translating between languages I understand how translation works um, and it's, it's just not true um, if you're King James only that's fine you can have that belief but please don't use my Facebook page to try and sell your garbage to me or anybody else I just don't believe that um, I believe you ought to take and read the scripture in four or five different versions. If you can study and learn a little Greek and a little Hebrew, uh, that helps. If you can go do word studies with Strong's uh, concordance and, and go through and, and figure out what the different words mean and how they fit together in sentences, um, you can come to understand the Word of God. But the number one thing is a relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who was there when Matthew sat down and wrote his gospel, the same Holy Spirit that wrote through Matthew lives and dwells in you, and he doesn't have to have an absolutely perfect copy of anything because there isn't any such. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect translation. Uh, translation is as much an art as it is a science. And uh, so people do their very best to translate. They use the very best materials they can find. Nobody's really out there trying to deceive you with one version or another. So um, uh, NIV is probably got some things that will confuse some new believers um, but on the other hand for people who read on a sixth grade level or less and that's about half the population of the United States um, if, if you read on a sixth grade or a fifth grade level um, you can still understand NIV um, if you go to King James you're going to be lost if you go to New American Standard, the language is going to be a little more than you can handle. Um, if you've got a PhD or a THD, um, you can probably handle any version out there. So um, I'm using HCSB, and uh, if you don't like that, you don't have to be my friend. It's okay. Um, but let's start reading. Accept anyone who is weak in faith. But don't argue about doubtful issues. One person believes he may eat anything, but one who is weak eats only vegetables. Note, Paul has an opinion. Paul says it's the weak guy who doesn't eat meat. He says if your faith is strong, you can handle meat. Now, you'll get people on Facebook that say, we don't eat pork chops because we've got stronger faith than anybody else. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what Paul said. Paul said, if you don't eat pork chops, it's because your faith is weak. Um, you know, that's Paul's opinion. But he goes beyond his opinion. And he says, don't argue about doubtful issues. He says, one who is weak, this is Paul's opinion, only eats vegetables. One who eats meat, one who eats must not look down on one who does not eat. And one who does not eat must not criticize the one who does. Don't criticize each other um, over these things. Um, you do what's right with you. Now, if somebody starts arguing with you, there's nothing wrong with defending, and there's certainly nothing wrong with... Uh, like I just did over the, the versions of Scripture. There's nothing wrong with saying, listen, this is what I believe, and if you really, really, really have a problem with it, go find another friend. Um, and, and you can do that, but you don't want to get into 
big, long-standing arguments. I posted, um, I think it was today or yesterday, uh, a long thing about why uh, I'm not King James only, and that was in response to somebody who said they were and posted uh, five or six videos and a bunch of comments on King James only. So I went back and told them why I believe what I believe. But um, if it becomes a big problem and they keep posting stuff, uh, they're just going to have to find a new friend. That's all. Um, it's not worth spending a lot of time making extremely long arguments about. And that's what Paul is saying. And, and don't look down on each other. You may understand, you eat meat, you may understand that the vegetarian um, is weak in the faith. That's what Paul said. But don't criticize him because he's weak in the faith. Um, help him grow up. Encourage him. Encourage him to, to, to strengthen his faith. Uh, and don't push it. Uh, push Jesus. Uh, push faith in Jesus. But don't push uh, this whole thing about eating pork chops or not eating pork chops. Um, he says, one who does, must, does not eat meat must not criticize the one who does because, and I like this, God has accepted him. You know, the guy who believes that he should only read King James Bible should only read the King James Bible. Um, I think he's weak in the faith. That's my opinion. Um, but he should only read it. He should not go around on other people's websites who don't believe that and try and push his doctrine and put... Uh, of a hundred videos under somebody else's uh, site and try and uh, convince the whole world that they should only read King James too. Um, nor should I go on a King James only website or Facebook page. And I'm not ever going to go on a King James only Facebook page and start arguing about why they're wrong. I'm not. It's just not right. You aren't supposed to do that. If they come on my site, I will tell them why I think they're wrong. And if they keep insisting on putting stuff, then I'll just uh, block them. And they won't do that anymore. Um, it's, it's really, really pretty simple. Um, but I won't go on their website. I won't go on their Facebook page and make huge arguments. And they shouldn't come on mine and put their arguments either. Um, and so I'm not going to go on their site and criticize them. And I expect them to be reasonable and, uh, you know, uh, Christian about it. And I think they should read King James only if they believe that in their heart. But I don't think they have any right to go on somebody else's site and push their little private doctrine, their private interpretation, because certainly Scripture never mentions King James um, anywhere. Uh, Paul did not know King James. And I'm quite sure Jesus never knew King James, because I'm quite sure King James was never born again. So that's enough of that. But this is what it's talking about. Who are you to criticize another's household slave? I won't criticize somebody for reading King James only and believing that. I will criticize them for coming on my site and making a big deal about it. Um, but they don't have to read any version they don't want to read. Uh, but they shouldn't criticize me for reading what I feel free in the Holy Spirit to read. And that's what it's talking about here. Um, verse 4, who are you to criticize another's household slave? Well. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Uh, they're a slave of Jesus Christ. If they really believe that Jesus only wants them to read one version, let them read one version. Um, but don't let them come telling me that I'm awful and wrong because I don't believe that. Uh, and don't let me tell them they're awful and wrong for believing it because they aren't awful and wrong for believing it. They believe it, they believe it. Um, 
just don't come on my site and start preaching that. Um, and I won't go on your site and start preaching that. Okay? I won't go on your Facebook page and tell you over there that you're wrong. I guarantee you will never see my face or my name on your page. Um, and that's what he's talking about here. You're God's servant. I'm God's servant. God tells me it's okay to read HCSB uh, or NIV or NASB. I am completely free in the spirit of God to do that. I have absolute freedom from God um, to read whatever version I like. And um, I have absolutely no conviction that anyone is particularly more godly than the other. So that's where we stand. Um, but, um, he says, before his own Lord, he stands or falls. You know, it's God that's going to judge me over what versions of the Bible I read, and it's God's going to judge you over what you do. But we don't want you to violate your conscience in order to be like me. If it bugs you, if it bothers your conscience, if you feel guilty reading another version, for God's sake, don't read another version. Um, that That would be really stupid to violate your conscience and do what makes you feel guilty. I wouldn't do it. Um, before his own Lord, he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person, this is to the Sabbath only people, uh, one person considers one day to be above another. Some think the Sabbath is still very special for Christians and that Christians ought to follow the Sabbath. Um, that's what he says. One person considers one day to be above another. There's a lot of people out there who believe that Saturday is better than any other day and that God really wants them to observe the Sabbath. Um, I don't particularly see that or believe that. Um, I have nothing against worshiping on the Sabbath. I have nothing against worshiping on Tuesday or Thursday either. Um, it just doesn't bother me one way or the other with what day uh, I take to worship. But Paul is saying one person sees one day as important and another person sees another day as important. Um, and some of us see all days as being the same. And that's me. He says someone else considers every day to be the same. Each one must be convinced in their own mind. If you're convinced in your own mind that the Sabbath is holy and that God in the New Testament wants you to worship on the Sabbath, worship on the Sabbath. If you feel free to worship on Sunday or Tuesday or Thursday and you're free and you consider all days to be the same, for goodness sakes, worship when your friends and family worship. Um, you know, uh, if everybody else is worshiping on Sunday, don't stay home on Sunday and then, uh, you know, uh, go to church all by yourself on Saturday uh, and sit there looking at empty pews and trying to figure out why nobody's there. Um, that doesn't make any sense. And if you feel free in the spirit to worship on any day, then worship on a day that's convenient to you. Uh, but don't go screaming at people who don't believe like you do. I am not to go on the Facebook pages of people who believe in the Sabbath worship and start telling them they're crazy, they're idiotic, they're stupid, they shouldn't believe that. Um, that's not my position. It's not my position. I am fully convinced that all days are alike in the Lord and that I can worship on any day I want. I am absolutely convinced that I have that freedom. I am. But I am also absolutely convinced that if you feel like the Sabbath is special and that you ought to worship on the Sabbath, I am absolutely, totally convinced that you should worship on the Sabbath. Okay, you get it? Verse 5, one person considers one day to be above another, 
someone else considers every day to be the same, each one must be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day, if you observe the Sabbath, whoever observes the day, whoever, that means you. You know, if you do, that means you. Whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord he does not eat. Yet he thanks God. And whoever does not eat, yeah, there I, we just did that, because he thanks God. Verse 7, for none of us lives himself, and no one dies to himself. If we live... We live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. You worship on the Sabbath, you feel that's important. You belong to the Lord. I feel like I'm free to worship on Sunday or Thursday or Monday or Wednesday. Um, I belong to the Lord. That's it. If you live, you live to the Lord. If you die, you die to the Lord. If I live, I live to the Lord. If I die, I die to the Lord. It, that's what's important. He says, Christ died, verse 9. Christ died and came to life for this, that he might rule over both the dead and the living. But you, yeah, you, 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 why, why? Do you criticize your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? Can I look down on you? Um, anyway, um, why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before the tribunal of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. The law of love, verse 13, Therefore let us no longer criticize one another. Instead decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in your brother's way. What does he mean by that? If you believe eating pork chops is wrong, and I invite you over to my house for a pork chop dinner, knowing that you don't eat pork chops, Knowing that you believe that eating pork is a sin, and, uh, you know, I, I come over to your house and I bring a big pork chop picnic basket with me, and uh, I send you uh, pork steaks for Christmas. That's putting a stumbling block in your way, um, and I don't ever want to do that. If you believe eating pork is wrong, don't eat pork. If you believe eating shellfish is wrong, don't eat shellfish. But don't spend a lot of time trying to convince me that I can't eat pork chops or that I can't eat shellfish because I feel totally free in the Lord. I'm absolutely convinced that God doesn't care whether I eat pork chops or not. That's my personal feeling. But I am absolutely convinced that if you believe it's wrong to eat pork chops, it is wrong for you to eat pork chops. You get me? Okay. For if your brother is hurt by what you eat, verse 15, you are no longer working according to love, walking according to love. So, if I'm having pork chops for Sunday dinner after church, and I know you're Sabbath only, and I know that I know that I know, that you don't eat pork, I'm not going to invite you over to my house. Pretty simple. Um, you know, and if I know you don't eat pork and we go out to a restaurant and we have lunch together, I'm not going to order pork chops and eat them in front of you. Okay? Because that might be a stumbling block that caused you to fall. He says, therefore, do not let your good be slandered. If I think it's good to eat pork chops and I eat them, that's fine. If I think it's good to eat pork chops and I eat them in front of you and try to insist that you take a bite and try it, that's sin, and I'm wrong. 
um, and, and people are going to talk bad about me. I'm doing what I think is good, but it gets talked about as being bad. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we must pursue what promotes peace. On Facebook, on Facebook, we must pursue that which brings peace. And what builds up one another? I need to build you up, and you need to build me up. Do not tear down God's work because of food. If I offend you so badly over your pork chops or over the fact that you go to church on the Sabbath, if I offend you so bad that you get mad and leave God, I have just committed a major, major sin. Okay? If I eat pork chops in front of you and it makes you sick and you just hate it and you get angry and you run away from God and you sin, I committed sin in your life. That's what he's saying. Now he says, get this, in verse 20, do not tear, God's work, tear down God's work because of food. Now listen to what he says. Everything is clean. That's Paul's opinion. Paul believed that everything is clean when it comes to food. He's not talking about, you know, uh, pornography on the Internet is clean. He's talking about food. He's talking about pork chops, shrimp, and lobster, okay? And he says everything is clean. That's his opinion. He believes that. With all his art, he believes that everything is clean. It's okay to eat pork chops. It's okay to eat lobster. That's what Paul believes. Everything is clean. But it is wrong for a man to cause stumbling by what he eats. And Paul said that he tried to be all things to all people. And when Paul was hanging around with a bunch of Jews and he was going out to dinner with a whole group of of Jewish believers and some Jews that weren't believers yet, and they were going out to dinner after uh, the meeting at the synagogue, and they were going over to somebody's house to eat. Paul was not going to sit there in the middle of a bunch of Jews and chow down on lobster. He wasn't going to do it. But when he was in Ephesus or Galatia, and all the Christians sitting around the table with him were Gentiles, or they were liberal Jewish Christians who had grown in their faith to where they understood that everything was okay, and uh, they were having, you know, pork chops and lobster for dinner. Paul ate pork chops and lobster right alongside of them, um, and he didn't make a big deal about it. They put a pork chop on his plate, he ate it. Uh, because he didn't want to offend them. And that's what he's talking about here. He says it is a noble thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. If I know you have had a problem with alcohol all your life and I feel totally free to drink and I like to have wine with my dinner, Okay, I like to have wine with my dinner. I don't really. I mean, I don't even drink wine with my dinner. This is uh, an illustration. Say, I feel really free to drink wine. I don't have a problem with it in the world. And I pull out a bottle of wine, and you're an alcoholic, and you're dry, and you're Christian, and you're saved. And I take and say, here, and I pour some in a glass, and I set it over across from you, you know, right there, and I pour you a glass of wine, and I said, drink up, friend. It's not going to hurt anything. God loves you. God loves wine. There's no problem with it. And, and you drink a glass of wine, and then a second one, and then on your way home, you stop and get a couple of beers, and then you buy a, a bottle at, at ABC Liquor, uh, before you get home, and, and by next week, you're a smashed alcoholic again, uh, falling back into alcohol. 
what have I done? Was I free to drink alcohol? Yes, I was free to drink alcohol. But what did I think I was doing putting a stumbling block in your way? You understand what Paul's saying? Um, and this thing is frozen. All right. Uh -huh. All right. Come on. Uh, okay. So let's go back. Here we go. Let's go back. Uh, Facebook, let's go back to live, live, okay, connecting, okay, we're connecting, okay, okay, Go live. Okay, we're back live. We may have lost some of you because it went dead. I think it's got a time limit on it. Um, and boy, that angle of the camera, it, it, that's funny because now it's different. Um, and I'm back live here again um, but I don't know and boy that camera angle I don't know how that works because before I was tall and skinny and now I'm short and fat and that's funny uh, but we're live again okay uh-huh okay now okay um, let's go back to David. All right, there we go. Um, and we're live again. Uh, okay. I don't know. Anyway, let's see how this is doing. Um, can you see me? Uh, we'll, we'll do this. I'm just going to continue, and I'm sorry if I lost some people, but I'm going to continue anyway. Um, so then, we must pursue what promotes peace. Everything is clean, but it is wrong for a man to cause stumbling by what he eats. It is a noble thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother stumble. Okay, or do anything that makes your brother stumble. Keep it to yourself before God. You think that you should only worship on the Sabbath? That's fine. If, you're, if you've got a bunch of friends who believe like you do, and you've got a Facebook page on Sabbath worship and how important it is, that's fine. And if I've got a Facebook page all about how it's wonderful to worship on Tuesdays. And I have a Tuesday-only group, okay? I got a Tuesday-only group, that's it. Uh, or I've got an any day is fine group. Um, I'm not supposed to go on your page and make a big fuss about what you believe, and you aren't supposed to come on my page and make a big fuss about what I believe you know, pray for me. If you want to tell me once what you believe and why you believe it, I'll tell you right back what I believe and, and why I believe it. Um, and that's fine. That's a good thing, okay? That's a good thing. Uh, but um, we aren't to go on each other's page and try and destroy each other and, uh, you know, say why the other guy's all wrong and crazy. Because that's up to God, not me and not you. Okay? So, verse 22, do you have a conviction? Keep it to yourself before God. The man who does not condemn himself by what he approves is blessed. But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats. Did you get that? Did you get that? Okay? Listen to that again. The man who does not condemn himself by what he approves is blessed. 
But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats because his eating is not from conviction. And everything that is not from conviction is sin. I am convicted. I am absolutely convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's okay for me to eat pork chops. So the deal is this. When I'm with my family in my house and there's nobody around that doesn't like pork chops, I'll eat pork chops. When I'm with somebody who believes that eating pork chops is sin, I am not going to eat pork chops. I am not going to go on his Facebook page and tell him how wonderful pork chops are and put pictures of beautiful pork steaks all over a plate and tell him just how he really, really, really ought to try pork chops. Because if he believes that eating pork chops is wrong, Paul says that if he believes it's wrong, if he's not convinced, convicted that it's all right, that for him to eat pork chops is wrong. You understand that? For him to eat pork chops is wrong. For me to eat pork chops is okay. For him to eat pork chops is sin. That's what Paul's saying here. Read it. If you're convinced that you have to observe the Sabbath and you don't, it's sin. If I'm convinced that it's okay not to observe the Sabbath and I don't observe the Sabbath, that's okay. If I come over to your house with a bunch of beers and want to party on Saturday afternoon and I know you're a Sabbath-only person, come on, I'm not going to do that. If you have a Sabbath-only web page, am I going to get on your web page and tell you how wonderful it is at our Monday night Bible study um, and make a big deal about inviting you to go out uh, bowling with me on, on Saturday afternoon? You know, let's be reasonable about this thing. I think it's funny how I was too tall and too skinny the last time we were up, and now I'm too short and too fat. This is a crazy, crazy thing here. So anyway, that's the way it is. It's all squished, but um, we'll make this do. And we'll call this quits until next time, I think. Uh, let me see here. Uh, I agree we should not be at each other's throat. Uh, what is the map behind you? Well, it's a world map, but because uh, we've got all of this um, stuff up at the top, um, it looks really funny. Um, so, anyway, we're going to go. I am sorry. Um, if you look up at the lines up at the top, you can tell that this is really crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to call it bad. Uh, uh, we're just going to note that it's bad and end this thing. And I'll try and get this video on uh, by tonight. And you can watch it in living color and watch it again with real sound system, uh, a real microphone, and a high quality camera. Uh, and it may be easier to understand. Anyway, God bless you. Have a good evening, and uh, just be kind to each other, okay? Be kind and loving. And uh, if you want to invite me to go to Sabbath worship with you, I'll be pleased to go, okay? <laughs> uh, God bless. Have a good night.